let's get started here. So thank you very much for attending the meeting. So, uh, so this is about the ARM uh, debugging and the profiling tools training. And uh, the, uh, as you may know that the ARM's force tool uh, is made of three parts, DDT, map, performance reports. It used to be made of two parts, DDT and map. And the performance reports used to be a separate tool, but uh, starting the latest version 20.1, they integrate the uh, performance reports as well into the uh, ARM Forge. So uh, one clarification, uh, we don't cover GPU today. So we don't have a GPU licenses uh, at the moment. And uh, when you have a GPU license, then we will cover GPU uh, debugging, GPU profiling, et cetera. So just, just, to, yeah, just for clarification. And uh, we have uh, assembled a tutorial team, uh, myself and the Lori Staffy from NERSC and the, uh, from ARM, uh, Ryan, uh, he'll be their lecturer and Bo, Serena and Timothy. Thank you very much for uh, attending. Uh, Timothy, he's from Great Britain, I believe. So uh, we'll, I'll give a very brief introduction, uh, about 10 minutes. And then uh, from that moment on, the Ryan will take over and cover all three tools. And uh, in the afternoon session, we plan to have users work on their codes. And uh, if they want, they can get help from the ARM engineers or nurse staff. So far, five users indicate, you know, uh, have signed up. So we are thinking to uh, employ the, uh, the Zoom break up, breakout room for each coder team. And then the, the list of the codes is shown here in the Google Doc. Uh, you should be able to uh, see it and then edit it if you want. But I think that uh, uh, we'll cover this in the afternoon. So some people may just stay, uh, remain uh, here and then you know watch how the, uh, the the problems are being attacked and being uh, solved but uh, i want to mention that this is uh we are not the the arm engineers and we will probably provide some input you know how to solve the problem so we cannot i cannot say that we can resolve the problem today you know we just provide some input how to use tools what features of the tools to use etc so that is the intention of uh, this afternoon session. So please take a look at the at that the, uh, the Google file. And uh, to start with the, uh, this uh, the tutorial, I, I I need to mention about this uh, the separate tools here. So whenever you use the X window GUI tool over internet over internet, it is the if you click a button, you know, to move things around, is the response is really slow because of the intrinsic, the high latency associated with the X window connection between the client and server. So it's uh, really almost impossible to use it uh, over the internet. Um, so there are two couple of solutions uh, that we have. One is uh, to use a no machine tool. And uh, so NERSC users are using the no motion NX tool quite a bit. So if you go to that, the, uh, the NX web page, uh, it will show you how to install the client and how to set it up to use it for NERSC. And another one is ARM for the remote client. So this is basically you install the remote client on your laptop or desktop, but you start a batch job on Cori and then connect them together. So I sh my slide shows how, uh, how to configure remote client so that you can, you can work with the, uh, the batch jobs on Cori. So, uh, so Ryan actually will show you probably during his talks and demo, but I just want to show cover the uh, how to configure here. But anyway, this is the, uh, this, a screenshot of using the NX. As you see, so if you uh, connect to NX server, uh, you get the, this kind of desktop here, and then you can connect this one and click on that. You, you connect to Cori without typing password on uh, the 
uh, MFA OTP, and then you can start the uh, the the, the GUI uh, application here, just like here. So another way is uh, ARM Forge remote client, as I said, you download it on your desktop or laptop, and then uh, follow this method, you know, these steps to configure. So what, uh, start your client in the desktop or laptop and the configure, and then in the uh, in the window that pops up, we just uh, you know fill out this information using your username, not my name, and then you should uh, copy. Uh, you should put this uh, the the directory path exactly, and then uh, when you start to connect to the when you want to connect the uh, query using the remote client, just connect uh, that uh, select uh, that configuration. And then it'll pop up this window and uh, it'll ask for password on the OTP. But if you have set your SSH connection to use SSH proxies uh, keys, I, I, I believe that you must have heard about SSH proxy uh, uh, that, was a that is uh, developed at NERSC. And if you do that, it will not ask for password and OTP. You just log into the, uh, the query right away. So for that information, I suggest you to uh, read the MFA web page here. So as I said, so, and then you open uh, the uh, window uh, and where you SSH the query and you start the uh, interactive batches up, something like that. And you load the uh, linear forge module and then run the the Alinea Forge using the dash dash connect flag. And then this, win, uh, this uh, pop-up window will show up on your desktop and uh, you just click on accept. And then it will show, you can set the, the run parameter, et cetera, and then you can start right away. So, uh, so just, you know, if we haven't set it up yet, then, you know, I suggest you follow this step and do it yourself uh, for the training. And uh, we have uh, some training materials uh, stored, uh, saved in the, uh, the CFS file system here, directory, Global CF Cedars uh, Training 2020 ARM tools. And uh, it has a, a couple of directories. One is for hands-on materials. The other one is a Python demo material here. So it, uh, please read the uh, readme file there uh, to get the information how to clone the code and the copy the data file uh, if you want to run and the create a conda environment and uh, it also shows the how to run and uh, uh, read or without arm forge or you can just be you know copy the entire directory to your directory using the, this command so we have a job uh, we have a node reservation for today's tutorial so we have a 100 knl nodes from 9 to 2 p.m and the name of the reservation is ARM tools and the, the, the uh, project account to charge to is an N intern. So this is a typical, the SAL command that we use today. But if all the 100 uh, nodes are taken, then you should use your own project account. I think that's it. So do you have any questions? Yeah, Wusun, we had a question in the chat. Um, somebody was saying that when they tried to download Forge, they asked for a license. Can you go back to that slide, please? You mean the uh, the, uh, what is that? the remote client? Uh, yeah, I think that's correct. So uh, I think that it doesn't it doesn't ask for the license here. Actually, you can use it on your desktop, laptop. Uh, I mean, the remote client without any. Uh, ARM license. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, it's just a slightly confusing web page of at the very top there's a big get a license button in order to download, but if you just scroll yeah. down, you yeah, access. you just scroll down and the probably remote client is at the bottom of the web page. Right? Yeah, we uh, we found it. You just need to scroll down. Yeah, you need to scroll down. All right. Any other question? Okay, Ryan, you can take over. All right. I'll stop sharing. I 
can everyone see my screen? Am I, am I muted? Hello? Uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you all uh, for coming today. Uh, my name is Ryan Holgan. I am an HBC Senior Applications Engineer at ARM. And uh, today uh, on the agenda, we're going to go through the ARM software ecosystem for debugging and profiling HPC codes. Um, first, first off, we'll start off with um, the most popular of our tool, uh, DDT, which is our debugger. Um, and then I'll jump into um, generating a performance report um, tool. It generates a, a nice little one page HTML or text file uh, report telling you um, where time is being spent in your application. Um, it's typically targeted for, for, for people who aren't doing, who aren't diving deeply in the code itself, but um, perhaps they're porting to a new system and they want to get a feel of whether or not they're using the new hardware on the system uh, effectively. Um, and then following up with that, we'll go into um, the more detailed profiler map. And at the end of the day, uh, we'll cover how to use um, the ARM tools with, with uh, Python code. Okay. Um, so like uh, Lucent said earlier, uh, ARM Forge is our, our standard toolkit. It, it used to be both um, DDT and MAP, but now in the latest version, it also includes um, performance reports. Um, the beauty of this tool is that once you've once you learn it here today, um, if you happen to work on a different HPC system, um, chances are it's most likely already installed there. Um, uh, most of the large sites already have licenses, and um, uh, it, it's commercially supported by us ARM. Even though, even though some of the hardware isn't ARM hardware, I mean we still stand by supporting all of the major HPC systems. Um, and it's fully scalable. So whether you're, you're trying to debug or profile a really small code on like uh, just a couple of threads, a couple of MPI ranks or thousands or hundreds of thousands of MPI ranks, you know, the, the way they use the tool will be the same and you should expect um, our tools to, um, um, to work no matter what problem size um, you happen to deal with. Um, we like to think that our our interface is very user friendly. A, lo a lot of the things that you'll see me do is just move the mouse and just hover over things, right click, um, very intuitive. Um, and if, if something is not clear, you can always click on our, our user guide um, by, by simply pushing F1. So yeah, like I said, the other tool that we have is uh, performance reports. Um, so you, you get metrics around CPU, memory, IO, um, and even energy. Um, if, if that's a uh, part of your license. Um, and, it, and it's something that you can do uh, once you have an established code and um, you want to track how, how how it performs over time. Um, so, so, so maybe like a new compiler comes out and uh, you want to you, you want to create a history of, of um, if your application changes between um, compiler versions or library versions, you know, sometimes that could be uh, effective. Um, okay. So here, this is um, the, the layout of DDT. So it can be run in two modes. Um, on the left, you, you see it's um, in an offline, it's run in offline mode. And, and what that means is that you don't have to be physically at your computer uh, trying to, uh, debug your code. And that's useful, especially if you don't know exactly when you'll be able to get through the queue. Um, so you can place breakpoints ahead of time. Um, or if it's crashing, you can just run it in offline mode and DDT will run up until the point where the crash occurs. And then it will give you a detailed um, snapshot of what happened as soon as that crash took place. Um, meaning it'll give you the stack backtraces, uh, you can see um, 
what variables are in scope at the time, what values they had. Um, uh, and all that can, can be done in offline mode. Um, but the majority of our users will, will probably end up doing the interactive mode because it's, it's um, uh, you have more control about where it is in the code and what you want to look at. And uh, just a, a brief overview of MAP, our, our profiler. So the idea of MAP is to give you information quickly at a glance as to what happens when your code starts to when your code finishes. Um, you can see um, whether or not you're doing a lot of computation, at, which is what you, what, you, what you see in green, or is it heavily communication dominant, uh, which you see in blue. Um, if you see like a sawtooth pattern, that usually is an indication that you have some type of MPI load imbalance where one MPI rank is waiting on another MPI rank before it can continue its operation. Um, so if you aren't aware of that in your code, um, you can see it visually um, through our map profiler. Okay, and I'll go more into more detail about uh, profiler later um, in the talk. Okay, um, so our, our debugger. Um, so the idea is you, you've got your code and it's not working the way you expect it to. Um, so what, what you can do is you can use our, our graphical debugger um, to, to figure out you know, what, what is going on. Um, you, can, you can see information across all the different stacks and processes and threads. Um, like I said, if there's a crash, uh, DDT will take you exactly to the line of code where the crash occurs, and then it will tell you what the crash was and hopefully give you more information. Um, and you get the context of what's happening at, at that point in time. So uh, we have this thing, these things called spark lines. Uh, if you've never used DDT before, um, the way they work is um, if you have several MPI ranks, you can see the value not only of the current rank that you have in focus, uh, but also you get a graphical represent representation of this value across rank zero to um, uh, rank, uh, yeah, your number of ranks minus one. So across all of the MPI ranks in your code. Um, this particular slide here ha happens to correlate with an early preview release of an MPI library. And um, my PE was supposed to correspond to the individual MPI rank. Um, so as you can see, um, there are over 150,000 ranks um, that are being run. Um, but you would expect a linear uh, distribution of values um, from rank zero to um, the number of MPI ranks. And clearly, um, with DDT, they were quickly able to spot this ju just by looking at this one spark line alone. Um, so, uh, yeah. So how do you use DDT? Is there anything special that you have to do to make your code work with DDT? So, um, first of all, you, 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 you want to have debug symbols and you typically do that by passing the dash G compiler flag. But you can leave some optimization on um, but we, we, we like to recommend that you, you turn off optimization flags like dash O zero. Uh, because what can happen is that um, the compiler itself can choose to optimize out some variables or, or functions or make or inline some functions, making it difficult to debug, uh, depending on where your issue lies in your code. So like I said, um, if you have a, a crash, in this case, a segmentation fault, um, you, you run it outside of DDT, you get your little notice, hey, signal 11. Um, so as soon as you run it under DDT, DDT will tell you the same information, but it will stop you. And it will stop you at the line of code um, where, where the segmentation fault occurs. And at the same time, uh, you are able to see um, the, the current current variables that are in scope. Uh, so here we see X and Y, which uh, are integer values. Uh, tab is an array. And you can see um, 
what the values are for each of these items. So it turns out for this example, uh, we are accessing this array tab. And if, like I said, if you just hover over, over the variable, you can get some information with DDT. In this case, it tells us that it's a 13 by 13 array. Um, it's an integer array. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to access element X and element Y, which have the values of like some really big number in zero. So clearly um, the X value is outside of the bounds um, uh, for this array. And that's, that's the reason uh, for this segmentation fault. So just by quickly at a glance, you can see um, where you are in the code, where it crashes, and what values are currently. Um, so you got some other uh, bug in your code. Um, maybe it's not as straightforward as a segmentation fault. Um, and sometimes it, 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 it really isn't very clear as to exactly where the bug is occurring. Maybe your results are just a little bit off. Um, so the idea is for you to think as, think like a scientist. So you, you want to formulate a hypothesis of, of what you think the problem is. And DDT can help you um, gather your thoughts um, in, in, in what's called a logbook. So where you, you would um, click on the logbook tab and then you can use the pencil to write yourself a little note of what you think the problem might be. Um, because as programmers, we, we, we like to think that we can solve problems in a matter of minutes or hours. But in reality, it, it may take longer than that. It may take a few days, weeks, or a lot of your career trying to figure out you know, what's going on. Um, in which case, it's, it's, it's very nice to make sure that you have a nice set of um, notes handy. So in addition to the notes that you put in your logbook, um, every time you issue a command to DDT, whether it's putting a breakpoint, stepping over a line of code, um, adding a new expression to evaluate, um, it's all logged in this logbook for you. Every action you take, um, so that if you have to come back to this same problem at a later date, you can always open up your logbook and, and remember what exactly you had done previously, and then look at your notes, hopefully, that you you're able to make some progress. Um, so that's the idea of the logbook, to, to track your work, keep your thoughts organized, and, and for DDT, for, for any messages that DDT shows you, it will be um, recorded in this logbook, complete with timestamps of, of when things were happening and which uh, ranks are affected. Okay. Um, so here what we have is an example of a code where there, there was not, a, a, a bug is not apparent until you run at large scale. Um, so in this case, we're seeing over 24,000 MPI ranks. And um, um, you know, most people think that uh, get, they're, if they, they, they don't really need a debugger tool and they can just put out print statements and you know just just sort through all that information but if you're in this unique situation where the bug only exists at such large uh, MPI counts then you, you kind of need some type of tool to figure out what's going on um, so in this case they were able to use DDT to figure out uh, when they were running at this rank uh, they, they got a crash in this lib part ministry team at this specific line of code, so at this file, 556, and it, it looks pretty simple. Like they're, they're just assigning a value into this array, um, and, and they're, they're pulling a value from a different array uh, with this index. So i times nt samples divided by npes. So nothing looks strange here. Um, so the only thing that could be an issue is either the arrays are bad, maybe, but most likely it's, it's the index themselves. So either i is bad or, or this expression is bad. So what they did is they tried to evaluate i times nt samples or even just uh, looking at nt samples. So like I said earlier, um, they ended up 
trying to debug it with optimization flags turned on. Um, and by doing so, they weren't able to see the value. So they had to close out DDT, recompile their code with optimization flags turned off, and get back to the same point. So, um, and once they did that, now they see they've got value for I and value for NT samples. And both of those look, look pretty reasonable. Uh, and also NPE. So it's, it's this times that divided by this. Okay, so, well, when they evaluated the expression I times NT samples, um, they saw that the actual value turned out to be a negative number. And as you know, you can't index a negative number um, for an array, and that was what, what was leading to their crash. So, uh, and, and the reason for this is because they had an integer overflow. Um, so, um, they can see it just, just again hovering over the expression. They see this. They see that this is a type of integer. Um, so, so the way for them to get around that is to, to to work with unsigned integers to prevent this integer overflow. Okay, and yeah, um, yeah. I'm just going back. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so they were able to use DDT. Um, to figure out what their problem was. And they could see it clearly that they had a negative number trying to access this array. Okay, so just uh, going back to like more general uh, codes. Um, so DDT has the ability to work with um, version control systems. Um, so if you're working on a code and it all of a sudden starts introducing a new bug, it's more than likely gonna happen due to one of the latest changes. Um, because if it's working before, then clearly something new broke the code. Um, so if you have um, version control enabled in your code, you can actually see you know, just how long, how long ago a line of code was changed, and that should give you an idea of where to look first um, in trying to uh, dig through some code. OK. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch over to giving a demonstration, a hands-on. Um, but before I do that, are, are there any questions? Uh, Lori or Usain, I can please stop me if there are questions. Yeah, so far, not in the chat, but everyone feel free to ask questions uh, and we can ask them to Ryan. And so, so Usain, I sent you an email. Um, I don't know if you were able to copy over my latest files. Um, but um, I, I have it in uh, my arm training directory, this hands-on.tar.gz. It's, it's, up, it's um, updated to, to work on Cori. So the, the, the previous ones had some make file issues. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. So I'll type you over. OK. So, uh, yeah. so for this demonstration, just, you can just um, watch me. Um, and then later, you can go through the DDT code. But, okay, uh, hold on. Um, yeah. Could you uh, return to your slide deck? We have a question uh, about your last slide. They, they wanted to know about your statement, new bugs um, from latest changes. Okay, so, so the, the idea here is um, that if, if you're working collaboratively um, on, on a code and you, you realize the code is no longer working the way that you think it should be, um, either the results are off or there's a crash, um, more than likely, it's because, uh, and, and you know that it was working before, more than likely that the issue now comes from, from the most recent change. And you can check that. You, you, you can see on the left-hand side here um, just how long ago uh, a line of code was changed. So in this case, um, these two lines of code were changed an hour, less than an hour ago. They are the most recent change, and therefore they are the most likely candidate um, for you uh, uh, of being the reason that the code is, is no longer working the way you think it is. Okay, and we had another question Bo answered, but they wanted to know, does this integrate with Git or other version uh, systems? Um, I haven't tried it, so if, if, uh, if Bo answered it. Uh, yeah, Bo says it works with version control. Good. Okay. I believe it does, but I personally have not tried it. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so first I'll, I'll, I'll go over using the, the remote client. So I have this locally installed on my laptop. Um, I, what I did was I configured a new connection. You would just say add, and then from Wusun Slides, you can add in the information for connecting to Cori. Um, I already have that, so you can see what it looks like here. Just my username. Um, I didn't put the remote script. Um, it it's probably is a good idea to use a remote script like Wusun has. And the only difference is that, um, as you can see, that I am currently connected to Cori, but, but Cori doesn't think I have a valid license. And, and that's because um, that remote script wasn't loaded. Um, however, if I were to um, load the module over here, uh, which I already have, but so the, the idea would be to, to module load on Linea Forge and then Linea Forge on, on the Cori node uh, will pull up the license for me. Okay, so, so first off, I'd like to go over uh, just a, a quick demonstration of the features that are in DDT. Um, I do have submission scripts uh, in, in case you want you wanted to do it that way, but I'm going to do everything through an interactive job. So, but you can see the commands in the submission script. Whoops. And it's, it's, it's just simply making sure you load the Linear Forge module. And I'm using what's called Reverse Connect. So essentially, the compute node on Cori is talking to my remote client since that I've already connected to. And it's establishing a communication that way to prevent all the graphical information from going over the network, which, which leads to a much smoother user interface experience. OK, so let, let me just uh, compile this. Time thirty eight. I have two fifty five. All right. Um, and the command is just so. So normally, when you run, you would just do s run, and to use our tool, we we just say put ddt dash dash connect in front of it. And like you saw, we're still inside. You're going to get this little pop up saying, Do you want to accept this reverse connect connection? Uh, and you just say yes, go ahead and accept. It has to do a little bit of handshaking. But eventually you'll get to the run window and this is where you can set some additional options which I will turn on memory debugging. Um, although this code doesn't have any memory debugging bugs, I'm going to highlight some of the memory debugging features that, that are available once you turn on memory debugging. Um, I don't need any of these checks on, I just need the fact, I just need to be able to use the memory debugging features and I'll go over, th over uh, what all these things do um, later on in the next section. But for now, I'm just turning it on. Um, I'm just enabling um, some memory checks to be um, turned on. Okay, so run. Okay, so this is an MPI code, and then by default, when you run an MPI code with DDT, all MPI ranks are going to set a breakpoint in MPI net. So we can see here at the stacks, uh, stacks tab that all four MPI ranks are at line 83 of the code, which corresponds to MPI net. Hey, Ryan, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Is there any way to make your text larger? I can only make it larger in the editor, unfortunately. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, 
That helps. Okay. Uh, so, so for this example, I have a few uh, comments in place to, to remind myself um, how to move through the code. So um, here, I'm just going to add a breakpoint in this function too. Um, so at line 38, so just so adding a breakpoint, so that uh, a breakpoint is a position in the code that you want uh, DDT to stop as soon as the code hits that point. So what I can do is I can say add breakpoint for all. Um, so that is the, the very uh, easy way of, of setting this breakpoint. It's just going to this margin, right clicking, add breakpoint for all. Um, okay, and then for, for the next breakpoint here, I can put one at 106. Um, so I can just click here, and that also adds a breakpoint. Um, so I didn't have to right click at breakpoint for all. I can just left click in that margin, and that also adds a breakpoint. Um, and let's say at line 120, um, a, a third way of adding a breakpoint is actually going to this breakpoint tab. And you can see the first two that I've already added, they're at lines 38 and 106. And if I wanted to add a, an additional breakpoint, I can add one here. And the beauty of adding a, a breakpoint this way is that you have a little bit more control with this right click add breakpoint. So I wanted to add it to line 120. Um, and I can say only apply it to one process, apply to all processes. Um, I can stop after it hits it one time, or I can say stop if some variable meets a condition. It's like uh, some variable is less than one, right? Um, so it's, it's pretty flexible on how you set your breakpoints, but it's, for this example, it's not needed, but you, you could do it. So I'm gonna add a breakpoint at line 120, 120, and it also can break by the function name if I specified it here. Um, okay, so I have my first few breakpoints, so let me go ahead and hit play. Okay, so as soon as the first breakpoint was hit, which is at line 106. Uh, DDT uh, stops me and says, hey, everyone is at line 106. And if I hit pause, I can verify that in the stacks frame. Again, everyone is at, indeed, at line 106. Um, okay. Um, so at this point, um, I can see that the, the uh, on the current line, uh, I'm looking at argc and my rank, and both of those variables are visible because uh, they they correspond to this line that I'm I'm currently stopped at. I can see the argc is one for all of the ranks, and then my rank, as I would expect, goes from zero to n minus one, which is three. So, like I said, just, I just hovered over this value. Not only do I see it graphically, but I see it numerically from the range of zero to three. Um, so that, that's useful if you're looking at a variable across multiple ranks. Okay, at this point, uh, two different arrays have been created. So I have a tables array, which is a statically allocated array, and I can see it's a float 12 by 12, just by hovering over it. And I have this dynamic tables array. Okay, and it's a float star star. Um, it's dy dynamically allocated. It doesn't know its range, so you, you're going to have to supply that yourself. Um, now that everything is at line 106, these arrays have been initialized, and we have what's called the array viewer. Um, so for a static array, I can just right-click tables, view array, and uh, the range is automatically filled in. And we'll just click evaluate. I see the values for the array. Um, um, for process rank zero. Now, if I wanted to update this for say rank two, I can just switch my context over to rank two, click back over to the array viewer and just reevaluate it. And then you can see that the numbers have changed because now I am on rank two. Um, and I can do the same thing for the dynamic array. Only difference here is that I have to tell it 
that it goes from 0 to 11. But other than that, it's, it's nearly identical. Um, so, so this has given me the full array uh, for, for one process, or for one MPI rank. Now let's say I was interested in the first row, so hard code i equals 0. Um, so this gives me, uh, so, so I'm looking at the first row of this array um, for this particular rank. Now if I, wanted to vision, if I wanted to value this across all the ranks, I can say, I can, dis, I can uh, distribute it across uh, all, the, all the ranks. So there are four ranks. So as soon as I hit up in here, it goes from zero to three. You want to evaluate. So what I'm looking at is this is the first row of that array for rank zero. And this is the first row of that array for rank three. Um, and for all of these, I can also visualize it. So not only do I see the values um, for rank zero, rank one, rank two, and rank three, and it's nice, nicely color coded. Um, and if I wanted to, I can file, say, this as an image. So this is nice if you're trying to visualize um, array values um, in your code. OK. So that is the array viewer. OK, so we, again, so we are at line 106. Um, let me just move over to the next breakpoint at 120 by hitting play. Oh, actually, uh, it actually hit a different breakpoint. So um, I am now in line 38. All four processes are in, all four MPA ranks are line 38. And I can see from the stack tree that it was called from line 44. Um, so function one called function two. And the main program, by going by traversing it, was called at line 114. So this is kind of how you get the, this is the call tree. So, so line 114 called function one, function one called function two, then everyone stopped here at my breakpoint in function two, and they're about to return um, a value of 17. Um, but it's inside function two, I have um, some structures here. If I look at the locals tab, I see that I have what's called type two um, piece, where type two was a structure. And type two contains uh, an integer and a sublist. And I can expand on the sublist. And uh, it also has a, a character. So, um, so whether you're, you're dealing with structures or classes, um, DDT can show you the contents of, of, of those uh, very clearly. Um, in, in the locals tab, the current line tab, or you can just, you can add it to evalu evaluations. Um, so in this case, if I just put piece down here, I would get the same thing. And I can go through that. Um, so so, so you're if you're wondering, you know, where, where did all this come from? It, it's because piece is a type two, and then type two was defined up here to be this structure that had two integers and then a type one sublist. And we can see all those, all the members there. Okay, so, so the point of this is that uh, we can we can look at structures and classes, and we can see um, the stack call tree uh, of who of what function called what to get to where you are. So, so everyone is at line thirty-eight at the moment. Okay, so let me hit play to move on to my next breakpoint. Okay, so we are at line one hundred and twenty. Uh, pause here. Um, now, because we're back in the main function and no longer in function two, I mean, piece is no longer in scope, and that's why we see a value no single piece in current context. Um, we, we do see what is in scope through our locals tab, and you can see all these all various different uh, variables that have been defined. Okay. Um, so instead of moving back and forth between breakpoints, you can also do uh, step the, step the code. Uh, if you step into that, if there is a function call, it goes into the function. Uh, step over if there's a function call in the next line, it will execute that function and then return to the next line in your current 
wherever you are currently. And step out is if you are currently in a function, it will break out of that function. So your, your, your typical stepping tools and we can just step through that. And then we can see um, test is about to have its value of C adjusted. Currently it's this character. And then when I step over and look at it again, it now has value P. Okay. Um, so I am at line 122. Uh, another feature in DDT is what's called the, the watch point. Um, so what you can do is you can have, if you suspect a variable in your code is being changed without your knowledge, what you can do is you can right click it, add to watch point. Um, but similarly, you can just right click here, add watch point. Um, so every time this variable becomes updated, um, you will be alerted. So let's go ahead and let me see here. Oh, I wanted to add another breakpoint here for line 138. Okay, so let me actually, yeah, let me. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, want, I wanted to do a breakpoint for line 138, but I'd only want that to hit one time. So. Let me edit this, say stop after the first hit. Okay, and then play. Okay, so we are at line 125. Um, okay, wait. And I can look at threads by actually, where, where am I? Okay, let's see, stack. So at 125, actually, I need to get to 138. Let me go back. I'm a little ahead of myself. Uh, hit play again. Okay, so I am I am at line 138. Um, if I wanted to focus on the open and P threads, so they didn't exist before, and you saw when I clicked that thread, I didn't see four threads. But but now that I I am in an open and P parallel segment, I specify four threads. I can now see all four threads, um, and I can see um, the variables in that thread. So each one of them has an ID of my thread. Um, so thread four has a value of three, thread one has a value of zero, and again, I can compare across, just like I compare across processes, I can compare across threads. I can see um, the, ver the value of this variable, my thread, for all threads is, is different. And I also get statistics as well. Okay, so that's uh, OpenMP. Okay, uh, let me go back to group and hit play. So, so now that I have my watch points set, every time um, the variable is changed, um, I get a little notification saying uh, not only where it was changed. So here at, um, at line 154, uh, for, for only process zero, um, this, this variable was changed. It had a value of zero and now has a value of one. And I can uh, continue. Actually, before I let me let me pause all. Let me make sure I have another breakpoint. Okay. Okay. Um, and let. Yes. Yeah, so let me play. Okay. So again, my watch point is still still notifying me. Hey, your your values are changing. Okay. Um, that's fine, and I'll end. Um, if you're you're tired of seeing when that's changing, you can you can just disable the breakpoint, either removing the check mark here or just right clicking disable. Um, it's the same difference. Um, if you want to go back to it, you can always turn it back on. Uh, that way you can save it. Uh, okay. So, but at this point, I want everyone to hit line 165. So let me just go right click run to here. That's another way of moving to this line. Um, I'll get somebody get past it. Stacks. Too t yeah, so actually, I went a little bit too far. So some of the ranks actually got past that line of code. Um, 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable all breakpoints except for 165 and then restart my session. That way I make sure that everyone reaches that point. So the last thing I want to show you here is why I turn memory debugging on, and that is to determine whether or not your code has a memory leak um, using the interactive um, interactive debugger. Okay. okay, so I hit play. Everyone hits hits this breakpoint. Um, at the moment, there's not a whole lot of memory being used. If I go to um, tools, I can see the current memory usage. Um, it's not a whole lot in terms of bytes. Um, and I can also see it numerically with a table, you know, just several kilobytes, not a whole lot. Um, but if I put a breakpoint here right before finalize, I uh, notice that these free statements have been commented out, so I am actually leaking memory. Uh, when I get to that point, um, verify that I am at line 212. Yes, I am. Control our tools, view current memory usage. Uh, now, see, I have um, an allocation here of um, several megabytes, uh, 104 megabytes to be exact. And not only does it tell me that all four of these ranks have allocated that memory, um, it, it also tells me. Um, where it was allocated. So it was allocated at line 181. So at this point, you, you can kind of see that we're about to call MPI finalized, but hey, we're, we're still using a lot of memory. So there, th this particular code does have a memory leak. Okay. Hey, Ryan, question. Yeah. Um, someone in the chat wonders, uh, does the watch point work on a rank by rank, rank basis? So can you like adjust a watch point for a single rank? Can you adjust the watch? Well, let's see. Um, or their question continues. If the temperature is changed only on rank zero, but not on ranks one, two, and three, will it notify you or can you find out? Uh, yeah, so, so let's say I was only interested in the even, even number of MPI ranks. So what I can do is I can uh, create a group. I'll, I'll call it um, even. So oops, even. So, and it's going to have zero and two in that group. And I can say, uh, for this watch point, only apply to the even number of MPI ranks. So this, so this is kind of like what you're saying, the specific process. So in this case, I, I created a custom group. Uh, furthermore, I can say only apply to process zero. Um, so yes, the, you, can, you can selectively only watch a certain rank. And every other rank will be ignored. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Let me change my focus to all. Okay. So let, let me turn the breakpoint. Uh, turn the watch point on. But let me put put all my breakpoints back on. So the last thing I want to make sure that I, I get across is the fact that all of the stuff that we did, like I said, it's all in our logbook. Uh, well, I restarted the session and I didn't save it. Um, okay, hold on. We have another question. Um, okay, so what happens if, uh, for example, some of your MPI ranks never reach a breakpoint that you set, or if they come at different times? Okay, so what will happen if they never hit the breakpoint, so they'll be green. They'll continue running. They're doing their own thing because they never hit that breakpoint. So it would be up to you to manually stop it and hit pause. Uh, and, then, and then you can use the stack feature to figure out where they are. Um, so in this case, it tells you that rank zero through three are at line 212. Um, but for the one that didn't hit the breakpoint, you would actually look and see where it is exactly. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so I, I turned all my breakpoints on, I turned my watch point on, and what I can do is I can do what's called create a, a session file. And the idea is I want to be able to um, use these breakpoints and watch points at a later date, um, not only in, an inter in, inter in the inter interactive sense, but also through offline mode. So what I can do is I create this test.session file. 
and and then I'll go ahead and just end the session. So the test.session file contains all all the locations of my breakpoints and all of the locations of my watch points. Okay, so if I go back to my my uh, terminal here, and I can say generate me an offline report using this session file. And so what's going to happen is the, the debugger is going to be run in offline mode and every time those breakpoints are hit it's going to be logged into a nice little HTML report. Like I said, you, you'll see um, stack back traces, you'll see um, the variables that are in scope at that time, what their values are, what their values are across all the MPI ranks. It's all going to be contained in this HTML file so that you can look at it at a later date. So you don't even have to physically be at your computer at the time um, this code was run. Okay, so if I were to say copy that, let me make uh, it So let me copy it back to my local computer. And there's this is kind of a downside of generating HTML file is that you have to copy it to your local computer unless you have Firefox on your system, uh, which I'm not sure that is do. Um, so what's nice about this is that it's all self-contained. Like I don't even need the source code. Um, it'll it'll show me the snippets of source code as well. So at the start of this, you can see um, all of the breakpoints that I previously set in the interactive session. I mean, yeah, while working interactively, are now applied to this offline mode. Um, I can see that uh, a watch point was set for the variable being watched. Um, as soon as the first breakpoint was hit, um, I, I can see the stack view, all processes are at line 106, um, in which 106, um, as is right below MPI in it, or main. Um, I can see when the function 2 was called at that breakpoint, like we saw earlier, and I can see the, the stack backtrace, I can see that um, uh, main called function one, which called function two, um, and not not only do I have um, the name of the function, I have the line number, I have the source. So line one fourteen, it's this is this is where it was called. This is how it was called. Uh, these were the variables that were in scope at the time this function was called. Um, and then for function one, I called function two. Uh, and this was this was the code in function one where it calls function two. Again, I can see the variables that were in scope at the time, and this is how it, it returned. It returned a value of seventeen. Um, like I said, this is all in an offline report, um, all self-contained. Like I didn't need to copy the source code back. I have little snippets showing me everything that I might find interesting. Uh, um, question. Someone yes. asks, can you talk about the memory leak? How do you know that you have a memory leak? Uh, okay. So in one of the things, okay. Um, I keep, it probably won't show, okay, it does here. It shows me at the bottom of the offline report, I can see it gives me a memory leak report. It tells me um, all four of these ranks are, are, are leak in memory. Um, um, yeah. um, actually, I didn't, I, I, I didn't turn on memory debugging uh, with my offline mode. I, sh I should have, 
it, it's the memory debugging feature that, that tells you that there is a memory leak. Um, so if I were to generate another HTML file, it would show you. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, so to answer your question, it, it would show up in this leak report, but the, the fact that I did not specify um, in, in, in my offline command, so if I do dbt dash dash help, uh, if you saw in, in the interactive job, I, I, I checked the, the tick box for enabling memory debugging, but I forgot to do it for offline mode. Um, but if I were to say uh, dash dash mem debug equals fast, then I would have seen it in this HTML report. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of what I, what I wanted to, to, uh, to highlight. So like, it, like, like you can see, again, the watch point um, in my offline report, it tells me where, where in the line of code it was changed and then who it had affected. It affected all ranks. It tells me what the old value was and it tells me what the new value is. Okay, so that is um, generating an offline report using DDT. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to switch over to memory debugging. Okay, um, so memory debugging is that's, it's typically the case where you, you, your code works sometimes and sometimes it breaks. Um, usually, that's that's typical of some type of memory bug. Um, if that happens, um, you want to enable memory debugging, uh, which which I had shown. In interactively by, by checking this memory debugging box. Um, and doing so, uh, when you click on details, you get this memory debugging options. Um, and you have various levels of heap debugging, uh, with, with um, fast being the most basic. So a, as you move this, this um, slider from left to right, you're going to enable more checks. Um, and Based on the different checks, it'll do different things. So, so, um, um, so you'll see the different words show up. So there's like basic check fence. It'll check whether the end of allocation has not been overridden when it is freed. So this, all of these checks will happen for you automatically for everything that you allocate on the heap. Uh, so all you have to do is just turn on the, the functionality. Um, but as you go from left to right on the slider, it's going to come with a cost. Uh, typically, in, in terms of it's going to use more memory and it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, um, usually, balance is the best, um, best option to use if you suspect that there's a memory bug because fast may not catch all of the memory errors. Um, in addition to the sliders uh, for heat debugging, you can also turn on what's called guard pages. So, guard pages are um, similar to the concept of electric fences, so they they, um, they 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 protect areas outside of your allocations. So in case um, your code touches an area outside of it, um, DDT will warn you, "Hey, you're you're doing you're doing something wrong." Um, so so DDT will allow you to either put guard pages um, after or before a memory allocation, um, and and this also, it's going to eat up a lot of memory, uh, depending on how many, how many memory allocations you have in your code. It, it, if you suspect that you need electric fences and you have a lot of memory allocations in your code, but, but you're fairly certain which segment in the code that the problem might be in, uh, what you can do is you can you can start the run with memory debugging. Um, you can have it turned on. You can have you can put the slider on fast, and you can leave this checked off until you get to the point where the region of interest um, before the before that memory is being allocated. That way, the guard pages are only applied um, to the variables that you you are wanting to look at. Uh, so it's so it's it's pretty flexible on when you turn this feature on. Um, okay, so at that point, I'll, I'll switch over to 
the hands-on example for uh, memory debug. Um, uh, we said, is, is everyone able to, to access um, the updated codes? Sure, yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, so with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll actually, um, I'll let you guys do it. So in this memory debugging, um, the, the, there's a readme here. So essentially what I want you to do is to um, run it through DDT, first, first compile it, um, verify it does crash, and then run it through DDT and turn on memory debugging. Um, but first, so um, turn on memory debugging, but don't turn on current pages on at first. Um, set the heat debugging slider to balance and then run until DDT stops you. Um, and then from, from there, um, you can go on with the readme. So at this point, I'll, I'll pause to uh, let you guys um, work on the code. And if there are any questions, feel free to, to, to let me know at this time. Thanks, Ryan. Wusun, um, maybe we could put the slide back up that tells people where to find these examples or, yeah, um, where they can go on Cori. Thanks, Rusun. Um, another question in chat is, can we go back to the slide that talks about how to do the remote client setup again? Yeah, okay, uh, Wusun just linked to those slides too, everyone, so you should be able to see. But... And Ryan, uh, someone says, nice presentation, thanks. No, no problem. Uh, I, I hope everyone would find DDT useful. It's one of our most widely used tools. I mean, it's like I said, it's very intuitive on navigating your code through, through the debug. Okay, yeah, so uh, Wusun linked to the slides in chat, so you should all be able to download them. And he's showing you the two slides that talk about how to set up the remote client uh, for NERSC. Okay, Ryan, maybe you could uh, share your screen again and show everyone the exercises you wanted them to do uh, once they have their client configured. Okay. 
Um, yeah. So under uh, under the DDT folder. Um, so what I just shown is the DDT demo, and what I would like you all to do right now is the memory debugging. And the idea is to compile it, um, run it, verify that it does crash. So. And anytime you see like a double free or corruption, you know, that's that's almost a clear sign that you've got a memory error. So the idea would be to load it up in DDT, uh, make sure that you have the, the module loaded, in which case I have uh, Alinea Forge, just module load Alinea Forge. And once you do that, so module load Alinea Forge, I verified a crash, and then the idea is to run it through DDT. Now it's very important to remember to turn on memory debugging because if you accidentally hit run with this turned off, you can't turn it back on very easily. You, you can't turn it on at all. You'd have to shut down the session and, and start over uh, from the command line. So at this point, like I said, I would like you guys to put it on balanced and leave off guard pages um, and just, just um, see what DDT tells you with only um, the balance checks turned on. So, okay. And then run. And when you hit play, DDT tells you that there's a memory error detected or de-allocatable. -alloc um, we see that this for de-allocatable -alloc was actually called in check.f90, the Fortran code at line 66. Let me pause. Um, so there's a problem de-allocating memory. Um, that in itself doesn't tell you very much. Um, but the logbook, let's pull up the logbook. It says, hey, a previous write overwrote the reserved memory after the end of the memory allocation. So that is kind of like a hint. Well, maybe I should turn on guard pages and put it after things. And the way to do that is to go to control, memory debugging options, and then add guard pages one after. Okay, and then once you do that, um, you can restart your session to go back to the uh, to the beginning of the code. Say yes. Now this time, when you hit play, you're going to be taken to a different line of code because now we touched a guard page. Okay, so we're all at line 27, and it says a memory error detected in check, read right beyond end of allocation. So we were trying to, we were trying to set a value to this res array uh, with index k plus one. But res, as you can see, is just, just highlighting it or hovering over the variable. It's an allocated array of 10 T40 byte or 10 T40 elements, and we're trying to access element 10 T44, which is outside the bounds. Now, I don't expect you to, to fix this code or know why this happens, but um, the idea is that this plus 100 is actually shouldn't be there. That's the bug, um, but but we didn't know that 
from the beginning and we had to use memory debugging, uh, the memory debugging features on our dynamically allocated array in order to figure out that this was the case. Uh, Ryan, question. Is this an MPI example um, or is there a special module or something that needs to be loaded in order to use MPI debugging? Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand the question. It is an MPI example, but I did not do anything special. Okay, um, yeah, some users are talking about errors, but you didn't need to module load MPI or anything, right? No. Um, I mean, I can, I can show, I can show all, so these are the default modules up until 21. Um, and the only thing I had loaded uh, individually was Forge and Python, but that sh Python was not necessary for this example. So what kind of errors are, are they saying? Uh, um, well, one, I am wondering if it's because someone's on a login node, there's a PMI error that's particular, but then there's another error uh, from definitely a compute node. Um, let me scroll up. <clears throat> uh, check arm. Yeah, like if you, if you click um, arm DDT is configured to use MPI and it, it just stops before it will run is what Joel is saying. Um, we're, tr we're trying to help them debug in the chat here, um, but yeah, that, just to verify, um, uh, you only have the default. You have Python loaded and you have uh, Alenia Forge loaded. C correct. Uh, is it because they, do they need to load Cray PEKNL? Um, because um, that might be by default, let me check. I mean, I can I can show you the commands that I inputted. So I just uh, I I am um, I asked for an allocation on on Haswell with this, but I, I would not have thought the KNL would have made a difference. Okay, so there's nothing specific in here. Somebody's saying in the submit. Um, yeah, there may have been some. Has well info. All right, hold on. Oh, oh yeah. So in in, in my bash script, yeah, I, I do have constraint equals has well. If you're submitting through the script, then you you would probably want to change that to KNL for your reservation. Yeah, but 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 I was doing everything through an interactive mode, so um, all of that was just commented out, and all I did was these three commands. So you should work on KNL nodes, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there should not be a reason why it doesn't work on KNL. I mean, yeah. When the uh, you got the some very strange error, I usually delete the entire, you know, the dot linear directory and the restart. <laughs> so kind of desperate. You know, um, I can try getting onto KNL and see if that makes a difference. Honestly, it doesn't matter which which machine. It, it, the idea is for you to to realize how to use memory debugging on any platform. Okay, so so this. Uh, William, I think you want to be on a compute node. Um, if you're trying to compile MPI, I don't think that will work on a login node. I see. I'll give it a try. Uh, Stephen, to answer your question, I don't know that this example is on a slide. I think um, it was just Ryan showing his terminal. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's correct. I, I don't have... 
this on a slide. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I talked about memory debugging, but this is the example that uses these features. Could you maybe uh, throw your terminal again, then just show us the commands you want us to run? Yeah, OK. So it's in the submit.sh file. So I, you just, just load, load the module, um, run it, and then run it under DDT. Thank you. Um, did I did I turn on memory debugging? I don't recall. Yeah, I did. Okay, so yeah, so this is the K and L, and then I should be able to see the exact same thing. Yeah, I'm at line twenty seven. Yeah, and then we're accessing accessing res with a value of ten two four four. So yeah, it's it's the same thing. Okay, thanks for verifying. Yep. So we have a break scheduled for now, but I'm happy to help anyone else who needs um, assistance. Okay, uh, we are a little bit behind the schedule, but uh, can we get together uh, in 15 minutes, like 10.40? 10.40, yeah. yeah. And uh, Ryan, you indicate that uh, you can put uh, the guard page for for variable. I mean, how do you do that? The guard, the Mem for the memory debugging. I I thought that it would be for the entire for the all the heap variables, right? Oh, okay. So okay. Well, let me just demonstrate what what I meant by that. Um, Also, uh, you know, so the guard page the, is a four kilobyte, but what happens if we use a huge page? Uh, it will be a huge page size. Uh, that, uh, that I don't know the technical details yeah. on. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so, so you're saying, okay, so, so, so what I was saying is that you don't have to start with guard pages on. Right. You can run your code. And so this might be something like you have a flow simulation solver and you know that your grid routines are fine. The grid is the first thing that gets created and you don't want to put any guard pages around the grids because that just wastes memory. Um, so you can run, you can set a breakpoint to after the grid routine is called. And then once you hit that routine, uh, once you hit that breakpoint, um, let's see. Um, so at this point, it's it's res that gets allocated, right? Um, so so be, yeah. So, so so the idea would be to say, um, if I were to add a breakpoint here, and just pretend that everything that runs up to this point is something I'm not interested in. Um, but now I I suspect that there might be an issue in the code. At which point I can go to the memory debugging options. And now turn on guard pages. So guard pages will now affect everything after this breakpoint, if that makes sense. Right. So, every, so all future allocate statements will now have the guard pages. But anything previously will not have them. Right. So that, that, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. And then uh, similar, um, in, in the same fashion, you can, you can run to another point in code and then and then uh, get to that breakpoint and then turn it back off. You know, it, 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 the control is really up to you. Uh, but that's just helpful if if there's a certain segment of code that you want to drill down into. Okay. Okay. So uh, you said uh, what what time? Ten forty. Ten forty. Yeah, uh, 10.40. Okay. Uh, we'll be back at 10.40 then. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave this up here.
Okay, I, I'll uh, stop sharing you uh, and I'll show that the, uh, this uh, break notice here. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Well, I see your desktop. Yeah. So this is. Uh... This is NX. I I I started the NX client, and then um, the important thing is that you need to set the thing like that. And also, the, uh, this is to use the SSH proxy SSH keys here, right? So once you do that, then- um, so Can you make your text any larger? It's really hard to see. Really? So I, I do not know. I, know. I don't know how to control the end. Yeah, okay, all right. But anyway, so this, the instru instructions about the how to configure is in the NX web page. But the important thing is that you set this and you set this host name and port number. If we want to use SSH, uh, the key authentication, you have to select the uh, private key setting and then you specify the location of the, the, your, your key, which is NERSC in my case. So if you do that, um, then just connect, connect here. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a big server. Okay, so, so maybe I this is probably my previous. NX session. I don't know why it takes so long. But anyway, you get this desktop here, and this button is for Cori. So you are letting in on Cori. Right? So SL log. You can you can do here, or basically you can run any X uh, X eleven apps here. Yeah, so that's the idea. So you just say, uh, let me click it. You can run SL log. Me something. So I'm using my allocation account here. Okay. Not load linear force. Again. Something like that. Then it, it pops up right here. So we start. So I don't have to do a you know dash dash connect here because I'm using NX. Right? It's really slow. Is there any question? It's 1040. So Ryan can take over. Yep. All right. Um, okay, so we have a lot of uh, people reporting that they're having problems in the chat. Um, specifically, it looks like people have copied the training directory to their own uh, scratch, which is okay. Um, but then uh, it's the error is that the debugging, um, memory debugging is not linked. Yeah, okay. So, uh, um, so did the, um, did they select? Oh, hold on. So maybe we can go over. Uh, 
so the only thing I can think of is possibly they didn't check the tech. You're saying, but they're saying that if they check this checkbox, then it's not working right, which is I don't I don't understand. Uh, that is when you use uh, your dynamic link binary, and also right uh, right uh, right next to it, you select the uh, the your program language and the threading option here. It's a pull down menu. So this is a for trend, right? So I think that the, the default one should be okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is, uh, you know, when you use a C++, you have to select a C++, and if you use a threading, then you have to use a threading menu. Can you click on, can you click on that? The pull down uh, so this is just a screenshot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, really? it, yeah, we can help you later um, make sure it works for you. But I'm going to continue into performance reports. Right. Okay. Um, so, so it's important to profile your code, and when 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 you're running on a system, um, to identify hotspots because um, the little things can can add up in terms of performance, and you want to make sure your time to solution is as as fast as possible. Um, Usually, if you have a file I/O hotspot, it's going to be, um, it's going to have the greatest impact on sucking up your time, um, followed by communication imbalances, then memory usage, and then lastly, if you're not being vectorized. Um, so you you kind of want to identify that you do have a problem first, um, and one in one way that you can do that is to generate what's called a performance report with our tool. Um, the idea being that you run your code under the performance report tool and you generate this HTML um, like a summary of where where your where your time is being spent. Um, so for the example that we see here on the screen, we're running the hydro benchmark and most of the time, is being reported in MPI communication um, compared to the actual uh, CPU computation. And depending on your code, th there may not be anything you can do about it. Um, that you, you may just have a very communication intensive code, which, which, which would be fine. Um, in this particular instance, uh, we noticed that a lot of time is being spent in I.O. And then for each of these uh, categories down in the profile or down in the report, um, you get a more specific breakdown. So for the IO section, this is what was shown in, in this particular report um, that we're doing a lot of writing and we're not, we're not writing at a very high rate. Um, so, so when this, when this, when this person ran the report, they saw that, Hey, there might be a problem with IO. Um, the the suggestion is to use an I/O profiler to investigate which write calls are affected, um, but um, it, it it turns out in this case they weren't writing to a very fast file system. Um, they were writing a bunch of small files, and when they actually changed the code to write into a um, scratch memory instead, um, they got uh, a 41 times speed up in the overall code. Um, and you can see that IO has now gone down dramatically and uh, defective process write speed um, increased as well. Um, so this, th that's just um, uh, one example of using performance reports. Um, so I, another reason you might want to use performance reports is say that you don't have access to the source code, or you, you're only given a binary and some input file. Um, you're, you, and the only real parameters you can tweak are the input file, the number of threads, the number of MPI ranks, and the frequency of the I.O. for the run. Um, and well, one instance in where you may care about this, if you say you, you, you have a code that you know runs really well on Haswell and you want to 
run it on KNL, and then you want to make sure that you're using all of the KNL cores effectively. Um, and that that's that's kind of some information that you can get from a performance report. Um, let's see, so so for this hands-on, um, what I thought would be a good idea is to actually use um, the the lamps module that's provided by NERSC. So lamps is not it's it's a very popular molecular dynamics code, and it's not something that you as a programmer are probably going to modify yourself. Uh, you're going to use it, and you just want to make sure that it runs as fast as it can, um, given your allocation. Um, so if we switch over to the performance report directory, um, and again, all of my commands are in my submission script. So the idea would be to, to load the LAMPS module. So if, if everyone can, can go ahead and do this and generate uh, the first report, and then we'll, I'll, I'll wait a few minutes, and then we'll take a look at this HTML file. Again, I do want to stress that, you know, th th this was not our own code. This is somebody else's code. We have somebody else's binary. Um, uh, we, we have an input file. And the, like I said, the only thing we can tweak are the number of ranks, um, the number of threads, and possibly any parameters here in this input file. So in case it wasn't clear on how to use performance reports, you just take your, your traditional run command and just stick perf report in front of it. In this particular instance, I'm telling it to spit out a single HTML file with this name. Um, but if I, didn't, if I didn't put that there, um, it would generate uh, two different files, an HTML and a text file. And, uh, for some reason, this isn't running, or it's taking a long time. I think it's just waiting for the output to be cached. Um, well, while we're waiting on that to run, um, so um, I've already got a copy of it pulled down here. So, like, yeah. So if I Firefox. So like I said, it does make text files and HTML files, but the HTML files are much nicer to look at because it's nice and graphical. So what, what it tells you quickly at a glance is um, how, how is your, how is the time being spent in the code? So most of the time it's actually being spent in computation, which is, which is good. There's low MPI and very, very low IO. Um, it, it tells us, you know, um, uh, what was our command? You know, um, how many resources did we use? Um, how many processes? How many threads? And how long did it take to, to complete? Let me make sure that that's not running. I'm a little concerned here. Um, I wonder if. I wonder if it's because I'm on a KNL and it takes a little bit longer. Um, yeah, that could be. Um, okay, so I, I ran this earlier on the Haswell. Um, 
Encore, as you can see. Um, and the advice that was given was that, um, that so actually, <laughs> there really wasn't much advice here. Uh, it, so the, the application was compute bound. Um, looking at the CPU metrics, we can see that um, it's not a very vectorized code, but that that's probably that probably can't be helped. Um, under the open and section, it says physical core utilization is low, and some cores may be unused, and which is true. We're not using um, the bulk of the machine. Uh, you can try increasing open and VM threads. Uh, we 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 can. Um, but under memory, uh, actually, no one. I'm trying to get out here. Um, um, Well, so I, I didn't actually increase the open and no threads, but that, that was a suggestion. Um, but, but instead, what I had done is I chose to run it at a higher uh, MPI count, just to, to use more of the cores. Um, considering that, yeah, right, OK, this is what I was looking for. Um, uh, high values are usually bad. It's low MPI communication. So this code may benefit from a higher process count. Um, so what I ended up doing was instead of running on eight ranks, I chose to run on 32, since there are 32 physical available to me. Let me just take a look at how it's still running. Well, maybe there's something wrong with my node here. Sorry, it should not have taken that long. Module double flames. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so, so based off of this information, I, I, I suggested that we run with uh, thirty-two ranks instead of eight. And um, when you do that, let me, oops. Ah. Mm -hmm. So I can compare my 32 run to my 8 run. So I'm now, I'm no longer compute bound, I am now MPI bound. Uh, but instead of running in 26 seconds, I have now run in 14 seconds. So this advice of benefiting for a higher process count, you know, that was true. Um, I actually, I actually got it to run faster on the single node just by increasing um, the number of ranks from eight to thirty-two. So at this point, we've got MPI bound, um, and there's probably not much, a whole lot more you can do. Um, so I think that's just the nature of this code. Um, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy that I was able to get a speed up just by increasing the number of MPI ranks. I mean, it could have been possible for me to increase the number of open MP threads, but I didn't. Um, but now that I've used 32 MPI ranks, the advice for open MP says, hey, everything looks good. Um, it doesn't even say try and use more open MP threads because uh, everything looks good. Um, okay, so let me go back to my terminal. Yeah, okay, it's, um, so usually this thing will take about two minutes, even though the, the actual run itself is fairly, fairly slow. Um, that's because it's doing a bunch of sampling and analysis. And on a normal run, um, when, when, when your typical runs are several hours, the, the percentage of the analyzing time compared to the actual runtime is very, very, very small. Um, so, so here, I, I ge it, it generated um, 
the, the HTML file. Okay, so at this point, I, I use the advice, the advice to increase it to 32, and I'm, I'm fairly happy with 32. Um, so one thing that I can do now, I had, I had um, I/O turned off. Um, so if I were interested in in saving my data every so time step, every so often, so if I show you the difference between these two input files. Obstacle and obstacle output. So the only difference is that I no longer comment out this dump statement. So I'm, I'm actually asking it to save um, all the atom information every 100 time steps, which and this was the default for this example. Um, so I just, when you uncomment that, and then generate a new report, um, you get uh, what's seen. In, in this um, HTML file. Um, so it's, it's even more MPI bound. Um, it, it took more time. So it, it, it was 14 seconds without any IO. And the only thing that was changed was the input file. Um, so, so if I just clear and so the only thing I, I changed was I changed the input file from obstacle to obstacle.output. And we saw through the diff, the only thing in, that was different in those files was I requested a dump every 100 time steps. And by doing so, um, I, I now incur more of an MPI overhead, um, a much greater MPI overhead uh, compared to the previous performance report. Um, and it's almost, it's almost twice as long. Um, so the advice that performance report gives you uh, for MPI is to um, use an MPI profiler to investigate. Now, it, it just so happens that um, we, we know exactly what caused um, this increase in MPI communication, because we turned on the output routine. Um, now, if, if this were your, your starting point, this, and this was the first report that you received for your code, um, and you wanted to get a better idea of what's going on, you would have to dig into the code and use an MPI profile. Um, uh, for LAMPS, though, LAMPS is unique in the fact that it already has MPI timers built in. Uh, oh, I can't, I can't scroll up to it. Um, so it, it would be above here. I wonder why I can't scroll up to it. Um, so, it's like, yeah, so for, for the IO, once I turn IO back on, it says use an MPI profile to investigate. Um, but but uh, LAMPS has built-in timers for MPI task timing. Um, and it shows us that when we turned on our output by changing that input file, 28% um, of the time was spent in this output routine. Now, if your code doesn't have this MPI timing information, the only way to get that would be to either implement it yourself, make sure that it's all correct, put in your timers manually, or you can use our profiler. Um, so here you can see Matt tells you um, that 29% of the, it thinks 29% of the time was in the dump routine, which is corresponds to the output. And yes, these numbers are not exact, and that's just due to the nature of the fact that MAP is a sampling-based profiler, and it won't be exact down to the second, um, whereas this is probably um, down to the second based on the internal timing. Um, yeah, so. So, so like the, the, the takeaway from this is that performance support can give you a generalized view of how your code is running on the system based on your given, given constraints, you know, um, based off of, you know, uh, how many cores you have available to you, how many cores are on the system, how much memory you have, um, how many threads, 
and it it will give you some general advice based on what it sees. Um, and it would be up to you to decide whether or not you want to follow this advice. Um, so for the memory category, it's saying that the peak memory no memory usage is very low. Um, so I can actually run with fewer processes and have more data on each process if I knew how to increase the input file to make more data available on each process. So that, that's just something I can I could try if I if I wanted to. Um, okay. Uh, any questions about performance reports? Um, people were just commenting that they were having uh, trouble getting it to run. Even on Haswell, uh, it would time out. Um, maybe trying again or trying with more MPI ranks will help, but I'm not sure. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I don't know what to say. So. Um, yeah, uh, I, mean, I could I could try. I, I didn't do anything fancy, right? So all I did was um, load the lance module, and then load the forge module, and then run the perf report for me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So one user says with uh, thirty-two ranks, it ran faster. So it may have just timed out with eight ranks, and it, maybe it's it's our fault with file system traffic or something. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so that is a nice segue into to map. Which, which, uh, one, one last question. Yeah. Is there a special way to turn on the I.O. profiler or is that on by default? Special way to turn on, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, um, for the performance reports, I.O. profiling, that's on by default, right? Yeah, it, it's always tracking. Yeah. Um, okay. Tracking. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so you, you can see, like, initially, uh, I did not request any dumps, and I have 0% in IO. Um, and then once I turned it on, it's now 1.2%, right? Because um, now we're asking it to dump out atom files every 100 iterations, or 100 time steps. Um, yeah, so all, all of these on, are on by default. Um, yeah, you, you, you can't turn them off. Um, and a, a, as I mentioned, it, if you don't specify dash O, you get both an HTML and a text file. So if you were just, if you don't have access to a, a web browser to view the HTML file, you can actually look at the text file itself. And it's got this nice little um, text bar charts as well. So it, it's the same type of information um, but only in the text file format. Um, so this is kind of useful if you wanted to do an ensemble and you wanted to collect performance over time. Uh, you can always um, archive all of these little reports to make sure that nothing is broken. Make sure that everything is still consistent, you know, percentage-wise, based on what you expect the code to be doing. And into map. Uh, yeah. So, like I said, um, if you didn't have this information and you wanted to get more information about where the time is being spent, you would have to resort to a profiler or get it yourself by putting in your own timers. Oh. Um, oh, we already had a break. Yeah. Profiling with map. Okay. Uh, so. So, so MAP is our profiling tool. Um, the idea is, like I said, it gives you an idea of what your code is actually specifically doing uh, from start to finish, start to finish, where start is on the left side and finish is on the right side. Um, ideally, uh, we, we, we say that you, you, when you're using our profiling tool, you won't see less than a 5% total slowdown. Um, but I mean, if your code runs in like, 15 seconds, you might see a little bit more, but but for a general typical um, run, it we, we do not expect to see a 5% slowdown just using our tools. Um, it's a little bit higher on KNL uh, because KNL processing 
of the samples is a little bit slower because it's using a single core, um, but we're working on improving that. Um, so the idea is that um, there was no instrumentation involved. Uh, we didn't we didn't have to recompile it, but we, we do suggest that you do dash g so that you can see you can correlate uh, sample time uh, with lines of code. So you can see in particular uh, which line of code was taking the most time um, for, for, for any given run. Um, and these are little things that you can see at a, at a glance. Um, like, I, like I said, you, you can see uh, memory usage. If, if there, there's a memory leak for one or all of the MPI ranks, uh, you would see this in this chart. Like I said, this is when your code starts and this is when your code finishes. Um, and if you expected to, to um, free up all this memory, you, you, you should have seen a drop once, once the memory was deallocated. Um, something like this typically means, hey, you're, 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 you're being sloppy and you're not deallocating memory. Um, and I said earlier, um, if you have a sawtooth pattern with, with the blue MPI communication, that means your code is stuck in some type of MPI call and it, it can't proceed until it sends or receives information from somebody else. And this could be um, an MPI load imbalance. Um, and also you, you have access to the, um, uh, the, the CPU counters uh, based off of the instructions that have been retired. Uh, we, we can see whether they're actually um, accessing memory um, where in the code that happens, and we can see if our floating point is being properly utilized. Uh, we can see if the co code is being uh, vectorized, you know, at, at which point in the code. So, so at this point here in this particular example, um, the vector unit is highly, highly utilized. So um, that, 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 that's pretty good. Um, and that's for, for the majority of the code. So that, um, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so with these types of graphs, you can you can identify whether or not you have any type of bottleneck, uh, whether it's an MPI bottleneck, a CPU bottleneck, a memory bottleneck, or an I/O bottleneck. Um, so, what we have here on this slide is a a map profile that was generated for a two D Laplace solver uh, that was using um, in, uh, internal Jacobi iterations. And um, what was found out was that at line 203, like 42% of the total runtime of this 48.6 seconds uh, was spent in this code um, at line 203. But also we have 12.1% uh, spent at line 205, which um, there's no real calculation going on. It's just a comparison operator. Uh, we're, com we're, we're looking, we're computing a difference. Uh, we're seeing if this difference was larger than a previous maximum difference. And if it is, we store it, we store that. Um, so, so, so it, it, it in, in more easily to understand um, what that line of code was doing. Um, so, so this kind of translates to, um, if, if the difference was greater than next if, then this else do that. So all of that uh, was combined in, in, into this one line of code here. So you, you wouldn't expect just the comparison and an assignment to take so much, um, so much time um, compared to actually doing some calculations. Um, uh, but it turns out in HPC codes, if you have a conditional in your innermost loop, you're, you're almost guaranteed to kill performance. Um, so as soon as you remove that type of comparison in your innermost loop, you remove any type of if statement in the innermost loop, um, the code ran 20% faster. And, and, and not only that, um, the actual uh, computation is now, is now vectorized. Um, 
when I click on the lines of code and I can see on the right for, for line 203, uh, the instructions that pertain to this line of code being executed um, used uh, vector floating point operations. Uh, when you compare that to the previous slide at line 203, it was using scalar floating point operations. So this one line of code here, just commenting that out, um, made the code faster and made the code vectorized. So uh, the, 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 the takeaway here is that um, we, we, we spotted that a lot of time is being spent here and on the line that, that should have been of interest where the like the meat of the computation, um, it, it was not vectorized at all. And re removing that conditional enabled the vectorization. Okay, so, so that's one example uh, of using map to identify um, where time is being spent and to kind of give you a clue of, of what you might be, able, might be able to change within your code to get more performance out of it. Um, another example of using map is this clover, cloverleaf example, um, which, which you, you wouldn't know um, until you profiled it that there was an IO problem. Um, so in this particular example, we can see that the, the data transfer rate, um, it's not very high. In fact, it, 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 it peaks out at 14. I know that's hard to see, but 14 here is the maximum um, maximum value. So 14 megabytes per second when writing to the disk. Um, and turns out that that's actually extremely slow for this system. Um, so you, as the programmer, you got it, it, it prompts the question, why is this so slow? And it, it turns out that uh, what the code was doing was that it was just it was just writing ASCII text out to a file and the writes were not being flushed until the buffer was full um, and this caused poor IO performance. Um, one way to address that is to use HDF5 uh, and optimize IO library to, to write binary files and just making the switch um, for, from the previous method to using HDF5 uh, we see a much improved um, uh, total runtime. So the I.O. regions have, have, have shrunk compared to the actual calculation. And then now when we look at the disk write transfer, uh, we, we now have a maximum rate of 75.3 megabytes per second. So, um, and that resulted in um, uh, a more optimized code. Okay, um, so before we switch to the hands-on session, um, are there any questions with regards to Matt? Uh, we have one question in the chat. Someone wants to know, uh, can you get IO information from files like HDF5? Um, does it matter? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you, you'll, you'll get basic so this is all going to come from polling the system. Um, whether you whether it's specific to HDF five or not, the, 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 problem, the answer is probably no. Um, but if HDF five is the only thing that you're using for I/O, then in that case the answer would be yes. Um, but as for giving you specific HDF five data, um, no. Uh, the I luster don't... part of that, uh, yeah. Lori. Um, so we do support that, but that's not on your license. So if there is a interest in that, it's something we could like do as a trial type thing and MAP does support it, but your license doesn't currently. What is not supported by license? <clears throat> Luster. So MAP supports profiling with Luster, but the license you have doesn't have it. Yeah, but this is about the, uh, the kind of HDF5 interface, uh, the uh, usage, right? So this is really right. Yes, uh, I, I I think Bo was saying that you could get additional information about your Lustre file system um, if you had access to the Lustre metrics. But 
Correct. Which right. is different. Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Um, hey, and this is Shrimp here. So uh, one thing to understand, if your, um, your software dependency stack is built with debug information and is dynamic, dynamically linked, then we'll be able to scope the calls, right? And so you'll be able to see through a map profile if HDF5 is actually coming up on the stack as being expensive with respect to time. Most people don't actually build those facilities like HDF5 with all the appropriate debug and symbols and uh, do it dynamically. But if that addresses it, you'll be able to put, see your actual calls to HDF5 and see how much time they're taking as long as it's dynamically linked. Do you have any information about create build HDF5? Um, Sounds like Wusan, you, you, you're aware of something with a Cray build of HDF5 that makes it complicated. I'm not aware of that uh, discrepancy. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I guess he's asking me if the user was to use this Cray HDF5 module, would, would that be picked up by map? Um, the, the answer is I don't know off the top of my head. You'd have to generate profile and see. Um, okay. Uh, so at this point, we'll we'll move on to um, map hands on. So in this map directory, I have three different um, applications that are all performing um, matrix matrix multiplication. And the idea is um, the first one is going to be highly inefficient um, because it is not accessing data stored in memory um, in an efficient manner. Uh, the second one has a transpose version to fix that issue. But as soon as you fix that issue, another bottleneck, bottleneck shows up. I mean, it, it was there in the first one, but it wasn't as bad. Um, but um, it, it becomes apparent that once you fix one issue, um, another bottleneck in IO is still there. And to, to combat that, um, the, the final code is to use MPI IO library to help alleviate the IO bottleneck. Um, so, so with that, um, I'll, I'll let you guys um, generate map profiles for each of the three cases. So it's pretty pretty simple uh, for using map. Like you just load load the module, and then generate a profile with map dash dash profile in front of the code. And once you do so, you have a dot map file which we can then open. Uh, yeah. So I'll go ahead and start this uh, while you guys can do it in the background. Uh oh. What did I do? Oh, I forgot the S run. Uh, sorry about that. Because this is a slur system. Oh. Hey. Yeah, it would help if I compiled it, wouldn't it? <laughs>
Yeah, well, I'm not speaking at the moment, so this is this, this would be time for for people to try out the map tool, and then once they've got a map profile, and then we'll we'll open it up uh, with map and take a look at it. Now notice that I, I, I said map dash dash profile. So this this generates it kind of like in an offline mode to generate the map profile and it doesn't require the GUI. I could have very easily uh, replaced dash dash profile with dash dash connect and then have have my GUI um, bring up the profile as soon as it was done um, in an interactive manner, just, just like DDT. Um, but like it, just like the offline report, if, if I wanted to do this and not be physically at the at the computer when, when the profile is done, I can just submit this to the queue with S batch and then come back later and then look at the map profile. So once the map profile is generated, I now have uh, this dot, dot map file and I can look at it. So if you're using NX, you just say map onto the file name. Um, but since I'm using a remote client, I'm going to do map dash dash connect to it. Uh, yep. And this is going to open um, the map profile that was just generated. Now yours may look a little bit different because you may be running on the candle node. The, the idea is the same. Um, you're looking at trying to figure out where time is being spent. And if necessary, um, thinking about ways that you can spend less time in, in, in that region of code. So, 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 so right away, um, we can clearly see that all the computation is happening here at this part of the green. And then we have a whole lot of MPI communication going on. Um, in in the, the main thread stacks, uh, we can see that um, almost half the time is being spent at this mmult routine. Um, so mmult is a function, and if I wanted to know the source code associated with that function, I can simply right-click it, view source for this function. Uh, that'll take me down to the function itself, um, which pin which would let me pinpoint that line 63 uh, was, is actually where all the time is being spent. So I did that through the source code viewer, but I can also could have expanded it here. Um, and it would have told me that line 63 is what I was really interested in. Um, so, so almost half the time is spent at this one line of code um, and it's it, it, it's not vectorized at all. It's doing a whole lot of memory accesses. And it turns out that it is not accessing the B array in an efficient manner um, because it's striding over J, and then J is not the innermost loop. Um, A is fine because it's striding over K. Um, OK. Um, so the idea would be to first tackle this problem, say, what can I do? Um, to spend less time at this line of code. And uh, one, one way that you could tackle this problem is to, instead of multiplying by B, you can multiply by the transpose of B 
so that you are also straining, you, you are not accessing um, every J, J element. And um, that is what the second profile is for. Um, note that I use map dash dash connect to open this profile. I could have also used the GUI to open the profile since I'm connected to Corey. Um, uh, and then go to load profile data. And pull parameter map. And I also generated the second map file. So this was after applying the transpose. Um, it's taken less time. Now we can see that the actual matrix multiplication itself is now less than 10% of the total runtime. Um, but now we have this uh, over 70% of the time is being spent in MPI finalize. Now that seems a little weird, um, but if you were to highlight this, try to figure out what's really going on here. Why, why is everyone at the end of the code what you're really interested in is not everyone who's finished, but you're interested in this one guy who is not finished. So it turns out that rank zero is stuck by himself calling this mwrite routine. Uh, that happens for almost all of the total runtime. So um, in this particular view that I have selected, it, it actually counts for um, uh, 3.1%. So, so it's 3.1% compared to the other ranks. So I guess I, I need to make that clear. As you go up um, from 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 the bottom up, uh, you're looking at all of the different MPI ranks. So at, at this point in time, let me let me uh, reset. So at this point in time, half of the MPI ranks are doing calculations, and half of them are doing. Um, are in MPI, are in an MPI call. Um, you, can see, you, you can see as I move my mouse from left to right that the information at the bottom here updates relative to my location. Um, so if I'm not fixated on a specific uh, point in time, I get the average value. So uh, for the full run, most, about 87.5% of the time is being spent in MPI. Only 11.2% is being spent spent um, doing actual computation. Um, but for an instantaneous point in time, um, I can see um, the ratios um, at the bottom there. OK. Um, and it, it, it also um, moves down here in this view at, as I move across. So I, I know exactly uh, where to look for in the code based on where my cursor is. Um, like. Uh, like, I, like I said, in, in, this, in this region here, um, most of the time it's, it's spent either in finalize or, um, or mwrite. Okay, so let me, let me highlight this region again. Um, so mwrite, which was in line, and it's basically doing an F print F. Um, basic serial I.O. Um, so what you can do, and it, it, we know that all of the rest of the MPI ranks are just sit, sitting there doing nothing. Uh, they're just waiting, waiting, waiting for rank zero to spit out a file. If we can somehow convert this code from a serial I/O to a parallel I/O, then we'll get a much, much nicer. Um, uh, We'll, we'll get much better performance because we'll, 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 we'll not be wasting a whole lot of time here. Um, th there won't be a lot of impair ranks just sitting there doing nothing. So that's what the, the, the third map profile will show you um, if you were to generate that. And I, I can leave that to you to, to figure that out. Okay. Uh, um, question, Ryan. So yeah. is there any way we can look at a specific rank um, or uh, do you see them all kind of averaged? 
So the way MAP works is it, it, it takes samples from all of the ranks and then it, it averages them. Um, so, okay, if I were to switch, let me, let me focus on a different view here. Um, the, the short answer is no, you, 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 you cannot do that. Um, just, just due to the nature of, of our sampling based um, profiler. Um, so we have several different presets here. Um, by, by default, you see the main thread activity, CPU flowing point and memory usage. Um, you can also get uh, more in-depth CPU information. Um, you can get um, more in-depth, um, sorry, instructions is probably more um, useful. You can see if the integer, if there are any, any integer operations are compared to flowing point vector operations. Um, and the, the shading means that um, you, you can see at the bottom there, you can see like uh, rank one had 0% vector floating point uh, operations, um, but rank 19 had all of its operations um, uh, using the floating point vector unit. Um, but you cannot single out a specific rank um, in, in, when generating a map profile. So it's just an aggregate of all of the bearings. So for example, in this case where rank zero was spending nearly all of its time at the end doing the right, you knew that by thinking about the code, not by map pointing you to, that's what that rank is doing. Correct. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, let's see. If I were to reset, I might have been able to pull that information out. Um, okay, let's see if, if I do present here. Um, no, pro I, I probably wouldn't be able to, to, to get that information. So with the sum Intel tool, uh, you know, those can be run in the NPMD mode so that uh, the, we apply the uh, Intel tool for a certain rank, but the rest without the, the, uh, the Intel tool. But I'm not sure if that can be run here. I mean, the, uh, you know, run the pop report on you know, rank zero only, and the rest just the A dot out. Uh, I'm not sure if that can be done. Um, well, we can profile selected ranks, but by default, it's not, it's not, um, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't save specific rank information however if you were only interested in one rank you can say map dash dash profile dash dash select rank equals say four um, in that case you would be guaranteed to only have information from rank four which may be what you're interested in uh, but by default we don't separate out each of the individual ranks we have um, averages of, of everybody I, I hope that makes sense. Um, if you wanted that information, you would have to do select ranks for each of the individual ranks, and you have to do separate runs of map. If you only were interested in that rank's information for the entire run. Uh, I'm going to chime in here. So hopefully everybody understands that when you're talking about hundreds and thousands of ranks on a big scaled system, you want to do this aggregation process. You don't want to be recording information per rank. And that's the premise of MAP. So uh, as Ryan highlighted, if you're trying to hone in on a particular rank's activities, um, first you, you can identify that there could be a possibility of a particular set of ranks causing some kind of hang up or being a bottleneck. And then you have to rerun MAP selectively identifying those ranks. But by default, it's always going to be this aggregate type of process. Yeah. And the reason we do that is because we can't possibly store all of that information and still manage to keep the map profile under 500k. Like it, 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 the, the amount of information would grow if we saved it for each individual rank. Okay. 
Um, okay, so that, that, that's it for map. Let me see if I have any other slides here. Uh, nope, the next bit would be for Python. So, uh, yeah, let me just go through these slides quickly. Um, so not only can you profile regular scene Fortran code, but you can also profile Python code. Um, here we just have a, a, a basic um, Laplace solver written in pure Python, uh, which is going to be slow um, because it's not utilizing any of the um, NumPy libraries. And what you'll see is that a lot of time is being spent in the Python interpreter, um, which is to be expected because you're, you're just working with pure Python. Um, but you can see your Python script and you can see, you know, hey, most of the computation is, are happening at these two lines of code. Um, uh, compared, compared to actually doing like a C call, um, a lot of time is being spent in the Python interpreter, which is just to be expected. Um, I won't get into too much details other than it's not, it's not as efficient if you were doing something better, say using NumPy arrays. Um, and as, you, as soon as you do that, um, you get much more better, you get much better performance um, running that with Python. Um, and the, the reason you, you can't compare this to the previous slide because this, this actually ran 10 times more iterations and it took 22.9 seconds. Uh, whereas here it took 27.7 seconds and it didn't do as much work. So, so that these were the input parameters. Um, so 10 times more work in about the same amount of time just by switching to um, using NumPy. Um, yeah, that, that's really all I wanted to, to get out for this. Okay, so that was the ARM cheat sheet. So like, like we've shown, it's very simple. Um, you don't have to recompile your code when using that, but we do recommend that you, you do put dash G so that you get line, um, source code line information. And yeah, and then you can open the lock, um, you can open the map file either just directly like if you're on NX or with reverse connect, like I'd shown. Uh, one thing that's nice about map files is that you can, you can email them to your colleagues. Uh, they can open it up, as, assuming they have an exact copy of the source file that's not unaltered. Um, they can, they can open up their profile. They don't need a license to, to look up, to look at a map profile. And then you can have some discussions, but hey, a lot of time is being spent on here. Um, is there anything that we can do? Um, should we consider a different type of algorithm? Um, would we benefit from maybe using threading in this region? Um, so those are kind of questions um, that, that, that you might be able to answer from looking at a map profile. Um, yep, yeah, so, uh, so one thing I did not touch on yet is like OpenMP. So MAP does support OpenMP and then sometimes um, you, you think OpenMP is actually helping you, um, but you, you, might, you might have more synchronization overhead um, and it probably won't make sense um, for, for a particular one to, to have OpenMP in a certain region. So that's, that's something you don't know until you run it through with a profile. Um, if it's, if it's doing some type of OpenMP wait um, and it's not doing anything, it's not utilizing the, uh, the CPU effectively. So that's something you can spot out. Okay. Um, so the last thing I do want to cover is um, using DDT with Python. Oops. So, so hopefully by now everyone is familiar with DDT. They understand, you know, what kind of things it can do. Oops, actually, I mean, oh, let's go to Python. So this is actually a mixed code. Um, it has C and Python, but the C is only for, um, the C code is only for IO. It, it has nothing to do with the actual computation itself. Um, so what I would like everyone to do is to um, 
uh, compile this code and then let's launch. You, you have to load the Python module. And then let's launch DDT on this Python example. Uh, one thing I do want to draw your attention to is that if you are going to debug a Python script, you have to have this percent Alinea Python debug after you call Python. Otherwise, what you end up doing is that you end up trying to debug the Python binary rather than the Python script that you're interested in. Um, in the future, we are looking to make sure, make all this happen automatically, so you don't have to do that. But for the time being, um, you have to pass in this um, option when debugging Python. This is brand new, right, Ryan? Yes, this just came out a couple weeks ago. Maybe two weeks ago. Uh, so this is just a simple Python script. I don't need any memory debugging, so I'm going to turn that off. Does it support memory debugging? I haven't tried it. I, I would think that it would, but I don't know for sure. Um, yeah, so in this case, we, 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 we managed to set a breakpoint at the start of our Python script. Um, so what I'll end up doing here is I'll just show you that, hey, um, in our main function, let me just set a few breakpoints here. Um, set a breakpoint here. And then um, so some NumPy arrays get created, and if you're a master link, let's, let's uh, put a breakpoint after that's allocated, and then for everybody else, once they have their arrays allocated, I'll put a break, breakpoint as well. Uh, one thing I do want to make note of is that you, you cannot put a breakpoint on a blank line or on a comment because they would just do nothing. Um, if you did this with CR Fortran, they would put a break, the breakpoint would hit at the next uh, legal line of source code. Um, but this is not true in this case for, for Python. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so let's uh, go ahead and hit our breakpoints. So the first one is at 114. Okay, so our, our stacks view worked the way we, we think it should. All eight ranks are at line 114. Um, if I were to look at the locals, I can see what has been defined. Um, we have our MPI communicator. We, we now know the number of ranks, which is eight, which is correct. Um, rank has not been declared yet, but as soon as I step, we will now have uh, rank. Um, so Spark plans are not available at the moment for Python. Um, so I'm only seeing the rank for, for MPI rank zero. But if I wanted this information for all the ranks, I can com compare across processes and I can see that yes, they go from zero to seven. And, and again, you can also see the statistics um, of, of all these values across all the ranks. Um, okay. Um, yep. The, the next thing I, I wanted to demonstrate is once the 
once the NumPy arrays are created, uh, we can uh, we can also see their values. So, um, so my C, you can see, is, it, it should be array full of zeros. Um, so currently, for for NumPy objects or objects that aren't basic Python, um, you, you, you're going to see their type at remote address. Um, but if you wanted to get more information from it, you would have to add it to an evaluation and say, uh, so let's look at my C. Um, but to, to see its contents, we have to first convert it to a Python list. So when we do that, we see we have a 512 Python list for my C. Um, and each one of those is, is also has a list of 512 length. And when we expand it, we can see it's all zeros, which was which is what we expect because uh, my C is just NP dot zeros. Um, um, so so that's that's working the way we think it should. Uh, we can also um, look at an individual element. So my C say what's one one one, um, and again. You're going to get this uh, Python NumPy float 64, but if you wanted to know its actual value, uh, for the time being, you'd have to put dot two list um, at the end of it. Oops. So, one C one one dot two list, and then you get the numerical value. Um, Okay, and, and the same thing would, would be true for, say, uh, my A, right? So, so this is now random. Uh, two lists. So this should be a bunch of random numbers, and when I expand it, I should get a bunch of random numbers, and I do. Um, so yeah, other than that, you, you can use CDT just like you would in normal code, uh, but now you can see Python objects. And for we, we are fixing this to where we have we will have pretty printer arrays so you don't have to do that you don't have to specify two lists to see the values uh, but for the time being this is what you have to do okay. uh, any questions with regards to Python debugging so this is a brand new feature uh, we're hoping that you guys would actually test it out and give us some feedback on it, if there's something that's not working right um, we, we we, we would we would very much appreciate any um, any feedback with regards to Python debugging. This is great, Ryan. I'm glad you guys added this. Um, all right. So at, at this point, Bori, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Sure. Just one minute. Um, I did cover everything. So. So this is just information about the remote client that's in my slides and the hands-on session. But yeah, okay. All right, if you stop sharing, I can share my screen. Okay, you guys can see my messy desktop. All right, so here I am on Cori. I'm just gonna demonstrate using performance reports, which we've already seen, um, but now uh, do that with Python. Um, so I think Wusun put the repo uh, on CFS, but just in case you didn't, it's here. Um, I'll put this in the chat, maybe. I can find it. All right, well, maybe somebody else can. It's kind of hard to see the chat when you're sharing your screen. But anyway, it's here. So we're going to clone the repo. We're going to use a real example from Desi. Uh, uh, we can't use real data, so Stephen Bailey kindly gave us some uh, simulated data. Uh, we'll just quick build a cond environment, which is our recommended way of installing um, any Python module that you need that is not in our default. Um, and then we're going to run on KNL. And I did confirm that this ran yesterday, so I hope it'll run in a few minutes uh, for the tutorial today. 
Um, and I can't see the chat, so if anybody has questions, maybe uh, Musan, you can interrupt me and ask. All right, so uh, in the interest of time, um, I've done some of these steps already, but you can see in the README um, exactly uh, how to clone the repo and how to copy the data. Um, the data files are too big to be on GitHub, so you just copy them uh, out of my scratch directory. I'm also going to uh, skip this step here um, in the interest of time, but this is just how you build the kind of environment that we need. Um, we've got this kind of new thing here uh, where you're going to clone uh, this environment we've built called Lazy MPI, where we've already built and configured uh, MPI for Pi for you on NERSC. Um, so that skips the steps. Um, you know, you can just start from there. And then you just add in, these are the dependencies that the DESI um, code uh, from Stephen and Daniel, who I see is also on this call, um, needs. So we'll install these things and uh, activate our ARM demo um, environment. So we're going to start here. Okay, and you can type conda list. I guess I should probably make my terminal bigger, huh? Is that better? Okay, no one's complaining, so I think it's all right. So you can just see um, we've got things that we need like AstroPy, Desi uses Numba, Speclight. So yeah, this this just helps us verify that the um, the environment is the one that we want and it has what we need. Okay, so great. Now I'm going to get a KNL node. Not using the reservation, but hopefully it's all right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go to my home. This is um, this is where I put my uh, directory. Um, and you can see I've actually, I've cheated and I've already generated these profiles, but we're gonna do it again um, live. So first I'm gonna source this, um, I've got a file in here called run setup where I do a little bit of housekeeping for you. It's just gonna set num threads and it's gonna set some things that the does the code requires? So I'm going to do a source run setup. And then um, this, this just is the directions for running the code without profiling. But obviously, since we're all here to learn about the Alenia Forge tools, um, the point is to demonstrate that. So, OK. Um, we already have uh, our Python module loaded. Um, so you can see that that's here. So the only other module we need um, is the Alenia Forge module. OK, so that's pretty easy. And that's it. So we're going to append perf report at the beginning, and then we're going to run our code, um, otherwise exactly as we usually would. Um, so this is an MPI code. We're going to use 68 ranks. Um, so you can see uh, this MPI is an argument that Desi uses. Um, these are the, out, the input files and the output files that it will write. We're using C4 because um, that's the best way to use the KNL hyperthreading. Um, and yeah, so there's no instrumentation. We don't have to add any markers. Um, I think that's really great. And so this, this takes a little bit um, to get going. I think as we've seen with the other examples, I think it takes like three or four minutes. Um, but then it will run and it will produce this um, uh, performance report. Um, so it's it's probably the fastest, easiest way that I know of to get um, Python profiling information um, for your code.
can answer questions while we wait for this to run, if anyone has any. I guess there are none here. I'm just gonna stop for a second and check the chat. Okay, it looks like no questions so far. All right, so I'll share my screen again so you can see. Lori, this is Bo. Um, my understanding is you're, you're focusing on performance reports today with Python, which is great. That was definitely a priority. But since you have a minute, um, could you just kind of uh, mention your experience already with MAP? I just wanted to make sure that everyone was familiar that um, uh, yeah, sorry. So I'm not, map. I'm not demoing that. Maybe uh, Ryan can, but uh, so MAP also works for Python. I have used it. Um, if you go to our NERSC documentation, you just Google NERSC profiling Python. Um, I can put that in the chat or maybe Usun or someone can. Um, but we, we talk a lot about how to use different profiling tools. We kind of go from easy to hard. Um, we need to update this page actually to include performance reports, so it's not on there yet, but we have a whole section um, specific to using um, a map for Python. So we'll talk about how to um, set up the remote client just exactly the same as we've done today for the other examples. We talk about how to profile um, an MPI code. So again, I use the DESI code um, as an example in the documentation, but um, it's it's really nice. It's a good way to get uh, pretty detailed information about your code um, with a little less headache than some other profiling tools. Who I, I don't want to shame here, but um, yeah. So if if you try out these steps, um, if you find any uh, issues or anything we need to update, let us know. I think we wrote this page about a year ago, so it's possible that it may need a little bit of updating. Um, but yeah, we uh, we have this information. We're happy to help you if you want to use um, Map for Python at NERSC. Is that what you had in mind, Bo? Do you want me to talk any more about anything? Just referencing that is great. No, that's perfect, Lori. Um, we do have a question here, Lori, if your thing's still running. Um, when I, I tried the conda create command, got an error environment name not found, could not find conda environment lazy MPI for Py. Uh, okay, did you module load Python? So um, here, I'll show you in another window. Oops, don't download that. All right, so we're going to go to query. We're going to module load Python, and then we're going to conda env list. So OK, these are all of my own environments, which you guys will not be able to see because they're mine. But these two exist in our base Python module. And so everyone should be able to see um, base and lazy MPI. Um, so uh, whoever asked that question, uh, if you type um, conda env list, is this what you see? This is super extremely slow. <laughs> um, if it doesn't run in a few minutes, I'm going to exit out and just run on Haswell. Um, so we got a response on that, Lori. Um, I only <clears throat> I only got this base global slash common slash query slash software slash Python three six anaconda dash five point two. Oh, three six. Okay, here's what I think has happened. So you at some point ran conda init, which uh, has automatically added several lines to your bash rc file. That is setting the Python three six module as your default. Um, so yeah, if that's the case, you're not going to see this. Um, the probably the easiest way is to go into your bash rc file um, and comment out the lines that conda has added. So that's that's the that's a drawback of using conda init on 
well, anywhere, but at NERSC especially, because it, it makes permanent changes to your configuration file. So um, if you go to NERSC Python, for anyone who might be facing this issue, um, yeah, so if you do conda activate, um, basically it's gonna add files that look like, uh, or lines that look like this to your bash rc file. Um, and so that, that may be fine because that means you don't have to type modulode Python anymore, but you should know that it's permanently making this change to your setup. Um, so in this situation, um, you don't want that because you wanna be able to use our newer Python module. So I, I would just quick comment these lines out. You'll need to log out and log back in for the change to take effect and then it should work for you. So it looks like we're finally going. Okay, good. So we're running. Um, this is our 68 MPI ranks. They're reporting out um, as they extract um, or parts of the DESI uh, spectra. So what they're doing, yeah, Stephen or Daniel could explain uh, as well since this is their code, but we're um, converting a raw CCD frame into usable spectra. So it's a real science application. Okay, well, while this runs, I'll use this uh, for one more um, PSA about your configuration files. So I know we had a little bit of trouble with some of the users here today um, having added uh, customizations to like their bash RC file. And I would just warn you to check on that every now and then, make sure that you don't have anything in there that you don't need or want, because um, you never know when it's gonna complicate your, your life. <laughs> I keep, I keep nothing in my bash RC file personally because I'm afraid that it will affect my work in ways that I can't anticipate. So All right, well, this is taking a really long time. Um, so I'm just gonna show you the files that I generated yesterday. So like um, Ryan said, if you don't specify the output file, you'll get both. You get a text file and you get um, this nice uh, HTML file. So if you just wanna see the text file, oops. It'll give you this nice human readable report. Um, maybe this is nice because it's easy to, to just view wherever you are if you don't have a browser. Um, but I prefer the, uh, the browser-based report. So I'm gonna SCP this to my local machine. Um, but I'm gonna bring up another window to do that. Okay. Just verify my directory. And we'll get um don't want everything, I guess. Alright, so I'm just gonna get the uh Browser. Okay, so it's pretty fast. It downloads right away. And hopefully I can find my file. All right, so here it is. Um, and yeah, here's my performance report. So this is from Haswell. This isn't from Kano, but um, the same principles apply. And it looks just like the example that Ryan showed earlier, except it works for Python code, which is great. Um, so it will give you recommendations. Um, we're compute bound, which is good. Um, that's, I think, where you want to be. We're not IO or MPI bound. Um, and it will show exactly the same information that it showed for, 
for C or Fortran. So this is um, this is great to have for Python. Um, any questions? This is my window still running. Okay, but uh, I promise it produces the output um, that I showed you, and you should all be able to run it um, yourself, so you don't have to take my word for it.